First song this morning is Sing and Be Happy. We think about the words to this song, really uh, sing from the heart as God has commanded us to. We know that in the Bible we are commanded as part of our worship to sing, to lift our voices in praise to God, to uplift one another through our words. So let's think about that as we participate in song service this morning. Good morning. It's good to see you here this morning. Of all the people of the world, we're the ones who should sing this song every day. It's because we have a Father who loves us and cares for us, and we want to gather together on, on this day to worship Him, to give Him the honor, to look back upon the many blessings and the many ways He has cared for us. It's just a wonderful day to come together, and not only as individuals, but come together as a church family to encourage one another, be with one another. It is good to be here. As we begin our worship this morning, I'd like to share with you a verse of scriptures found in Psalms 118, the first uh, eight verses. This chapter is the middle chapter in most versions, and verse eight is the center verse in the Bible. I'll well, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever, that Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever, that those of Aaron say, His steadfast love endures forever, that those who fear the Lord say, His steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do for me? Let's pray. Father in heaven, who is a father of great love and compassion, we're grateful for your presence and your way you loved us. We're grateful for the Son Jesus. We're grateful for the church and the opportunities that we as individuals have to serve you and to honor you with the things we do this day and the days of our life. We pray you bless this worship service that we may do those things that will honor you to lift the spirits, to say those things that are necessary. We say those things, we pray those who speak that you'll bless their words, that will be words that will enrich your hearts, that we pray that you will bless those who are suffering. We know there are a number who are facing illnesses and, and we ask them to, uh, you bless them. We pray for those to take care of them, that your hand will be upon them and bring them healing and understanding. We also know that those who are here who carry burdens, we pray for them, that you would help them find comfort and strength in the face of days that are ahead. We ask you to bless us as we are assembled. We pray you bless us as we have time for Bible study. We pray you bless that effort and those who be teaching. We pray you open hearts to everyone. 
that we may truly be your people and serving you and consider it a great privilege that we can do these things. For this be our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Redeemed how I love to proclaim Let's bow as we pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you this day humbly, recognizing you as our God, our creator, and also as our Father. Lord, we come to you as humans, and we recognize that we are flawed, that we have weaknesses, and that we sin. Lord, we ask you to forgive us of our sins when we come to you in repentance. We ask you to forgive us when we do things that we know we shouldn't. And we ask you to also forgive us when we left undone things that we know that we should do. Lord, please strengthen us and help us to live each day, striving to be better with each passing day and more like Christ. Lord, we also come to you and we want to thank you. We want to thank you so much for all the, uh, the physical blessings that you've given to us. Thank you so much for the, the essentials of life, the food, the shelter, the clothing, the very air we breathe. We thank you so much for all these things. Help us to never take them for granted. Lord, we know that we are so much more blessed than many in the world living in this nation with the riches that we have here. Help us to understand that, Lord, to not take that for granted and to make sure that we're giving back and helping others in proportion to what we've been blessed with. 
Lord, we also have been so richly blessed from a spiritual perspective, and we thank you so much for the greatest blessing of all, Christ. We thank you for sending him. We thank, we're so thankful that he took on uh, manhood, that he came out of heaven, lived a perfect life, and then suffered and died to take our sins away and wash them. We thank you so much for him and his sacrifice and the forgiveness of sins that we have through him and that hope of heaven that we now have because of him. We thank you for your Holy Spirit as well and its guidance. We thank you for the, the word that we have so easily accessible. We thank you for uh, declaring to us all that we need to know to go to heaven and be with you. Thank you so much for that. And we do also thank you for that home in heaven that you've prepared. Help us to spend each day striving to go there and be there with you. Uh, Lord, we're so thankful for this opportunity to come and worship you. We ask you to be with us through the rest of this service. Help us to clear our minds of the things of this world, to open our minds and our hearts to you as we go through these acts of worship. Lord, we want to ask you to be with this congregation here at West Main. We want to ask you to be with our leaders, the elders. Be with them and bless them as they make decisions. Help them to guide us and shepherd us in a way that will be beneficial to the community here. We also ask a special blessing on the deacons as they carry out their duties as defined by the elders. Be with them as they serve. We also ask you to be with each and every member here. We all have different roles and different things that we do for you and your kingdom. Be with those especially that are Bible class teachers this morning. Help them to engage us in good lessons that we can learn and, and grow as Christians. But be with all of us as Christians in whatever roles that we take on, um, whether it's seen or unseen. Be with us and take care of us and help us to do everything that we can for you. Lord, we want to ask you to be with those that are in need at this time. We know that we have an extensive prayer list, those that are sick, those that are shut in, those that are hurting in a variety of ways. Be with them, comfort them, give them whatever they need, and be with those that are taking care of them, Lord. Help them to be better. Lord, we ask you to be with all of, all of us as Christians as we depart after here today, as we go into the world. Help us to set a good example to those around us. Help us always to be looking for ways to seek and save the lost. Help us to evangelize, Lord. Help us to share that good gospel, the good news of your Son. Lord, again, be with us through this service. In your Son's blessed name, amen. Song before the lesson this morning be I am a sheep. Ask if it's, if you're capable to please stand for the singing of this song. I am a sheep and the Lord is my shepherd, watching over my soul. My soul to keep guarding no free ever. Watching wherever I go. When the winds blow, He is my shelter. When I'm lost and alone, He rescues me. When the lion comes, He is my victory. Constantly watching over me. He is constantly watching over me. We are his children and he is our father, watching over my soul. Great is the love for his sons and his daughters, watching wherever I go. When the winds blow, he is my shelter, when I'm lost and alone. He rescues me, the lion comes, he is my victory, constantly watching over me, he is constantly watching over me. The title of this morning's lesson is Hearing the Heartbeat of God, and the scripture reading comes from 2 Kings 16, verses 5 through 9. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. 
Then Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to make war. And they besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome him. At that time, Rezin, king of Syria, captured Elath for Syria and drove the men of Judah from Elath. And the Edomites went to Elath and dwell there to this day. So Ahaz sent messengers to tiglath pileser king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son. Come up and save me from the hand of the king of Syria and from the hand of the king of Israel who rise up against me. And Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord and the treasuries of the king's house and sent it to the present present to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria heeded him, for the king of Assyria went up against Damascus and took it, carried it to the captive to Kir and killed Reason. Good morning to the greatest group of people in Mississippi. Well, it's clearly a better morning from this side of the pulpit than yours. So, But good morning to the greatest group of people in Mississippi. There we go. Uh, Clayton, all I got to say after that reading is, boy, college education is paying off for some of us. I mean, to pronounce some of those names, I'm a little worried that I'm going to get them wrong coming after that. So that was just outstanding, outstanding. Turn over to that text, if you would, in 2 Kings chapter 16, those few verses from verses 5 through 9, and that's going to serve as kind of the anchor, the foundation of our lesson today as we talk about hearing the heartbeat of God. Now hang with me till the end because Jim asked me, he said, I couldn't figure out what that verse had to do with that title. So we'll get there, I promise you that. We'll get there at the end of the lesson. But really what we're going to talk about is two things this morning. And that is something that's universal to every one of us. Fear. We're going to talk about what it means to be afraid and what we do because fear is not something any of us are ever going to be able to avoid. It is a part of life as much as being born and as much as passing from this life into the next. There's going to be fear in the in-between part. I mean, it's going to be a part of our lives that's recurring. I mean, again and again and again. But the second thing we're going to talk about and connected to that idea of fear is the concept of presence and how the concept of presence actually helps us to face and to overcome fear. Now, all of us, if we were to take a moment and go around, it would take all day for everyone in this audience today to share things and moments when we've been consumed with fear. Because they're so frequent. You know, when we're children, we have all sorts of fears that are different than they are when we become adults. My little grandson, Joshua, is my best buddy. Very best buddy. I mean, I don't know what it says about a 51-year-old man who's best friends with a three-and-a-half-year-old, but that's just the way it is. And we go and we do a lot of things, but most of the things that he is intrigued by and interested in and hasn't done before, he always wants to know, Bob, can we go do this? Bob, can we go ride the big tractor? Bob, can we go drive the lawnmower? Bob, can we go fishing? And in those situations... And I've seen cir circumstances where he'll go out and think about going and doing something on his own, and then he'll turn right around and come reach for a hand and say, Bob, can we? And we all understand that. There was comfort in our parents and in those that we trusted and loved and took care of us when we were children. I mean, you want a proof of this? You can see it today. Just go up to a little child anywhere near their parents because little child's, children tend to be a little bit shy, and just start talking to them, and they'll usually turn around and hug mama's leg, won't they? Or they'll come reach up to her and want her, and that's just what we do. That's our reaction to fear. There's been a lot of instances where I've been consumed with fear. Uh, interestingly enough, and I'll, I'll tell you beforehand, the preacher has never been arrested in my entire life. Never. 
Now, I spent a lot of time in a police car, but that's because I was police chaplain. I was riding in the front, just to be clear. However, strangely enough, I have had three instances with police officers when their weapons have been pointed at me. Now, that may seem impossible to have never been arrested. I wasn't doing anything illegal in any of those three instances. It was just strange happenstance circumstances. One was we were going shooting at a gun range or out in the country, and we happened to have like 25 weapons on us when we were walking out to the car, and he was driving by. It was just an unfortunate moment. Um, another was uh, there was a situation with a break-in. But the, the thing about the first one that I'll always remember, I mean, it's emblazoned in my men- memory, is I was about 14 years old, and we lived out in the country on a large track of acreage. And one afternoon, I had two young men from church that were in the youth group with me. And they were over at the house, and we had our BB guns out. And we're shooting cans. And to our great surprise, right out in front of where we were shooting cans, on this country road, pulls up two police units. One is a motorcycle police officer, and the other is a squad car. And the motorcycle officer pulled into our long driveway, so maybe 40, 50, 60 yards away from where we were, and the squad car kind of pulled up sideways on the road out in front of the house. And we had our BB guns in our hand, and there was a can down there on the ground, and we were shooting at them, and he pulls out a megaphone. You know, I don't know where he, I guess they must have a holster on motorcycles for megaphones. I don't know how that happened, but he pulls that out, and he says, Put the weapons on the ground. And I immediately dropped my baby. I'm glad it didn't go off and shoot somebody's eye off. But I dropped it, and I was terrified. Now, I'm going to be more terrified in this story because my friend, who never was the sharpest tool in the drawer, if you know what I mean by that, my friend takes it and looks at them and looks incredulous and waves it in the air and says, it's just a BB gun to which the weapons come out. And the officer in the squad car pulls the shotgun out from inside and lays it over the hood of the car, pointed at us. I was terrified out of my mind. Now, you think I was scared before? I literally can't think at this point. I'm trembling. And at that exact moment, now just imagine this. At that exact moment, my mother and father drove up and pulled in the driveway behind that motorcycle officer to the scene of two policemen pointing their weapons at their 14-year-old son and his two friends from church. Now, to tell you the conclusion of this story, that was a bad day to be a Richland police officer because they had to tangle with my mother who got out of the car and... What is going on? What do you, I mean, he, I know, I know that officer had probably never been poked in the chest as many times in his life as when my mother saw them pointing weapons at us. What had ended up happening is a lady had driven by earlier that day and saw us shooting our BB guns at a can and called 911 and said, there's three young men who are shooting rifles at cars. And they responded to this false information. What was interesting about it, though, is that as soon as I saw my mom get out of the car with that coal miner Kentucky rage that I knew oh so well, and marching over to that officer, and I saw when he looked out of the corner of his eye and saw her, and then it's almost like, look at her, look at the gun, look at these boys and he starts to drop it, then suddenly all of my fears, they didn't go away completely, but they were, they were eased dramatically because now mom and dad were there. And they were going to sort through this seemingly impossible, terrifying situation. You see, presence has a whole lot to do with how we face and overcome fear. Doesn't it? Well, with that in mind, let's turn back to the Old Testament and let's look at this 
passage in 2 Kings chapter 16. And this message about fear, it's for every one of us because just like my grandson's afraid of so many things and he wants to hold Bob's hand, just like that strange situation caused me to be so terrified to the core of my being, but then the presence of my parents in it eased that burden somewhat. You see, as I've grown, you never grow out of fear. They just change. And I'll say, and some of you who are younger, you probably won't fully accept or believe this, but you will know it someday. Fears don't necessarily lessen the older you get. Fears don't suddenly get wiped away because now you have a family and maybe you were afraid that you never would. Or now you have a career and, and you're not having to worry about how you're going to pay all the bills. Or whatever those things you used to be afraid of, here's just an absolute truth of life. When you get past the things you're afraid of now, there will be new fears. There will be new fears. You may not be afraid once you get that good position and you have that family, and, but now you've got children. And let me tell you, when you have children, your fears for them are compounded a hundredfold over your fears that you used to have for yourself. When you have someone you love and who's your spouse and you go through this life with, your fears, you have new fears, and in some ways they can be greater. You see, you never escape your fears. All you can do is face them. And how we do it is very important. And here we see King Ahaz. And he's going to give us a very helpful illustration through his life, through his story about facing fears. And it's not a positive illustration. It's a negative example of how not to face our fears. Now Ahaz, as we dive into the text, we're going to see that he's a king of Judah. This is during the period of what we call the divided kingdom. You remember that David came to the throne after Saul. And during Saul and then King David, the man after God's own heart, he who would sire an entire line, who would ultimately lead to Jesus, who would sit on the throne of David, and then his son Solomon after him, they ruled over a united Israel. A nation that was that group of people that had been brought out of Egypt and survived all of the wilderness wandering through God's provision, now they've conquered the land of Canaan. They hadn't conquered every single corner of it, but for the most part, they conquered under Joshua and Caleb the land of Canaan. And then they moved into the period of the judges, and they'd had a lot of unfaithfulness during that time. But God over and over sent them a judge to deliver them. But then the people said, we want a king like every other nation. So God gave them a king, King Saul. And then the great King David. And then the wise King Solomon. But then Solomon's son, Rehoboam, made some extremely poor decisions and followed not in the way of his father and his grandfather, David. And the, there was a civil war, Jeroboam, fought against Rehoboam, and the nation of Israel was torn into, into two separate nations. One which was capitaled in Samaria. They would later become the Samaritans in the time of Jesus. And that became the nation of Israel. And then the southern, the two tribes that remained loyal to the house of David and to Rehoboam became the nation of Judah. And for hundreds of years, they would exist as neighbors, right next to each other, as kinsmen, as brothers, but as separate nations, separated and often at odds with each other. So that's the circumstance in which we find King Ahaz. Now, interestingly enough, there are dozens of kings, both in the north and in the south, in Israel and in Judah. And of those in the northern nation of Israel, not one of them, not one, over the course of hundreds of years, will be righteous and faithful to God. They will be idolaters. They will lead the people into idolatry. And they'll practice the most reprehensible 
activities of the pagans around them. Now, in the southern kingdom of Judah, it's not much better, but it's a little bit better because over the course of dozens of kings and hundreds of years, we're going to see that some of them will be righteous. In fact, some of the most righteous people in Scripture, most praised people in Scripture, will come from this southern nation. Hezekiah. We see Josiah. That the Bible says there was no one like him before that would ever come after. That loved the Lord his God with all his heart. So they had some, some shining diamonds in the rough in that southern nation. But still, most of their kings are going to be like Ahaz. Now we read in verse 2, Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, indeed made his son pass through the fire according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Now if you don't know what that means, made his son walk through the fire, that is simply communicating human sacrifice of your own children. This man is of the house of David. Yet he's sunk to the point where he will engage in all the pagan practices, where he'll violate the very first and second commandments that you are to have no other gods before him. Yet, he's the king in the palace of David, seated on the throne of David, and the king of the people of God. He's not a righteous man. But fear is not unique to the righteous or the unrighteous. It is not a respecter of persons. It applies to everyone. And we see in verse 5, resident king of Syria... And Pekah, the son of Remalia, king of Israel, came to Jerusalem to make war, and they besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome him. Now, this is a very bad situation to be in in the ancient world because ancient cities often had walls, and it's very difficult to breach walls. I mean, you can take battering rams and try to knock down the gates, or you can build siege ladders. But either one of those, you're going to lose about 10 times as many soldiers as the people you're trying to conquer. So there was one very easy way to defeat an enemy that was holed up in their fortress. You wait them out. You surround the city with your army so nobody can get in and nobody can get out. And if nothing can get in or out, then what ultimately will happen? the food storage would become less and less and less. They'd run out of water first, and then they'd run out of food. And many, many times, they'll just surrender. So Ahaz finds himself in this situation where he's got two enemies. One is Rezin, the king of Syria, but the other one is Pekah, who's king of Israel. They're brethren Israel, just to the north. And they have banded together in an alliance, and they've surrounded the city of Jerusalem and Ahaz is rightfully terrified. Because when you surrender as a nation, the worst person to be in that situation is the king. Because guess whose head they take first? So he's afraid. Verse 6, at that time, Rezin, the king of Syria, captured Elath in Syria and drove the men of Judah from Elath. And the Edomites went to Elath and dwelt there to this day. So Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath Pileser, the king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son. Come up and save me from the hand of the king of Syria and from the hand of the king of Israel who rise up against me. Now what you need to understand about this is that it, it may not be shocking to us to read this, you know, thousands and thousands of years removed. And I can't even imagine a modern day comparison because there's no nation that I could use for illustration purposes that would rightly describe or rightly equate to what it meant that he contacted the Assyrians to help him. The Assyrians are the terrorists of the ancient world. 
They were absolutely the most despised and hated. You remember a fellow named Jonah who didn't want to go to a city to preach to that city and went to great lengths not to? You know what city that was? Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. Because the Assyrians, when they would, they would conquer and scourge everywhere they went. They'd burn everything to the ground and they would torture for fun the people that they conquered or carry them off into slavery and do things like put studs through their noses tied with chains and drag them behind their horses. This is a brutal people hated by everybody. And that's the people that Ahaz reaches out to. Now, granted, they're terrifying, but what a lack of wisdom because they're completely and utterly untrustworthy. Now, as you go down in the text, it says, and Ahaz took the silver, verse 8, and the gold that was found in the house of the Lord. Listen to where that gold was. He didn't go just into his treasury and take the king's silver and gold, and he didn't give it to a somewhat righteous nation. He took the lampstands and the bowls of incense and all of the gold from the house of God, from the temple of holy God. And he paid off the mercenaries, the wicked, unrighteous, terrible, violent, and abusive Assyrians with God's gold to ask them for their help. So the king of Assyria, verse 9, heeded him. For the king of Assyria went up against Damascus and took it and carried the people captive to Kerr and killed Rezin. So sure enough, the king of Assyria, he takes the payout, but he doesn't ride his army to Jerusalem to set them free. He goes and takes the juicy Damascus while the army's out of town and takes captive that and all of its riches. So he takes Ahaz's money. He uses the circumstance for his own well-being. And he doesn't care what happens to Ahaz and Judah. Because that's the character of the Assyrians. So what do we see here? In this passage, we see a man that we can, although we don't understand how he could be as phenomenally ungodly and wicked as he is, we do understand what it means to be afraid. We do understand what it means to face circumstances that are completely outside of our control and that we can't do anything about. So how did Ahaz react? How did he address or face this overcoming fear? Well, in verse 7, you'll remember it says, so Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath Pileser, the king of Assyria. You see, his first approach, his first thing that he did is he made his own arrangements. He formulated his own plan how to solve the problem. Rather than turning to God in trust, Ahaz tries to figure it out for himself. And I think that if we're honest, Although our circumstances would be nothing like Ahaz and our character would be nothing like Ahaz. In this way, I think that we, and when I say we, I mean myself at times. I think our first reaction to great fear is to try to figure it out ourselves. Maybe to think and formulate a plan. How can I work to make this fixed? How can I... You know, re-budget so I can pay the bills, whatever it may be. And I'll tell you, there's nothing wrong with working a plan. There's nothing wrong with making a plan. In fact, I would think the Lord would consider that to be diligent, hardworking, and respectable. The problem is when we first make our own plans. When we leave God, to the side, and we address our problems on our own. And you know that we're tempted to do this sometimes. And then just turn back to God when our plans don't work. 
or when our plans fall through or they're insu insufficient. You see, what Ahaz does is he doesn't turn to God, but rather he wants to fix it all on his own. And if we're honest, I think if we're not careful, we do the same thing. We, when faced with fear, rather than the first step being turning to God, it's often the last ditch step. And the first step is to fix it ourselves. A parallel passage to this would be found over in 2 Chronicles, which is interesting, the take we see here. 2 Chronicles 28, 19 through 21. First and Kings, first and Chronicles are kind of the same account. They have very different stories sometimes, but many of the same. But they're written, one was written to the southern kingdom of Judah and the other was written to the northern kingdom of Israel. So we see kind of two parallel histories here. And when we look in 2 Chronicles 28, 19 through 21, it says, For the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, the king of Israel. For he encouraged moral decline in Judah and had been continually unfaithful to the Lord. Listen to that description of his character by inspiration from the Holy Spirit. He encouraged moral decline and he had continually been unfaithful to the Lord. And also Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, came to him and distressed him and did not assist him. For Ahaz took part of the treasures from the house of the Lord, from the house of the king, from the leaders, and he gave it to the king of Assyria, but he did not help him. And what we see here from this parallel account is that his arrangements made his life and his problems even bigger even more problematic. And I don't know about you, but I've seen that in my own life. Rather than consulting God when I've just jumped in and tried to fix it myself, have you ever made it an even worse mess than it was? So we need to remember when we face fear, what should be our first step? To turn to Him first. We look over and our text again in 2 Kings chapter 16, and we read verses 8 and 9. And this is where it says, He took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house, and He sent it to present it to the king of Assyria. So the second mistake He makes right off the bat is not only does He make His own arrangements, but Ahaz takes that which is pro should be precious and holy, and He makes it profane. He takes that which belongs to God, that which is righteous and good, and He uses it for a purpose God never intended, and in that, He blasphemes His very God. And certainly none of us could follow in this exact footsteps of Ahaz. We don't have a temple, and we don't have, I don't think this would count if you, you know, it'd still be wrong, but it wouldn't be exactly the same thing if you came and sold one of the pews out from under the church. You know, it wouldn't be exactly the same thing because this isn't the temple. The temple of God is now God's people. But yet, the principle of what he did, that he took that which really belonged to God and he misused it for his own devices, for his own aims, to fulfill his own plans. How easy is that for all of us to do when we're faced with fear? I mean, do you have access to anything that is God's? That is a holy, precious thing that could be misused? Well, I have the privilege of living with a precious woman every day who was given to me as a part of my life from God, I believe, with all my heart. And given to me to protect and to honor and to uplift but I see people mistreat because of their stress, right? What's stress? Fear. And they mistreat perhaps a spouse or their children or whatever it may be that are holy gifts from God. Or what about the kingdom of God? We've mentioned that this building is not a temple, but we still are involved with the holy temple of God. Because our bodies are the spirit of the Holy, 
of the Holy, uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we worship together, we join together, and we worship God and are in His presence. We access Him every day. But even though Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God, it seems like sometimes when life gets stressed, when life gets hard, when we get consumed with fear, that's when people take the most precious things of life, that which we're supposed to put first, the kingdom of God, which is the church. Look it up in the New Testament. Church and kingdom are used synonymously throughout the New Testament. But yet sometimes the church, the kingdom, the things of God become last place in moments of stress rather than first place. So no, we don't have access to the gold of the temple, but we have access to even more precious things that are His precious possessions. We must never take that which is precious and make it profane. Which leads us to the third observation. And this is just simply taken from the overall story, and that is... Not only did he make his own arrangements, he took the precious and made it profane, but through it all, he ignored God's protection and presence. You know, Earl, we didn't plan that together, Earl and I, but his scripture reading today was perfect because it talked about from the Psalms the steadfast love of the Lord and how it never, you know, that love of the Lord doesn't cease and how we can trust in that love of the Lord. And especially the last part there when it talks about that he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Therefore, I can boldly say, what can man do unto me? Which is quoted again in Hebrews chapter 13. Let your life be free of covetousness. He says, for he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Therefore, I can say, you know what that statement is? It's a statement of overcoming fear. Therefore, I can say, what can man do unto me? That, that phrase only matters when you're afraid what man can do to you. You see, that presence of God is intended to be our power over fear. And as he says in the New Testament, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. And where does that come from? It comes from His presence. It comes from knowing that God is with us. And that can only be possible if we He has already pursued the relationship in the most divinely wonderful way He could. He came to this earth. He became a man. He gave His life for us. He did it all. He went more than halfway. But we have to pursue that relationship as well. But when you do and you have the presence of God in your life, it can change your entire perspective on everything, especially your fears. How important is that presence? It says in Ecclesiastes, two are better than one. For when one falls, who will lift him up? See, that's what presence is about. And the writer in Psalms, and the writer of Hebrews, they understand that God's presence is about overcoming. What can man do unto me? Overcoming the debilitating, destructive, but human and inevitable fear that we all face. How do we overcome? Well, perhaps the bigger question is, how do we really feel and be aware of God's presence in our lives? Well, that can only be done through faith. And I'll tell you, when something, there are lots of things in this life that are like unto God in the sense that we don't see them and they're, we know about them, but they just don't feel real to us yet. It was about 30 years ago that Lenore and I have been married a couple of years, and sure enough, she came home and told me the big news we're going to have a baby. And I was, what? 22 at the time, I think, and that was a terrifying idea, but I was all excited and, you know, but it didn't really become real to me until I went with her to an appointment 
and the technician took that, you know, that wand with the big ball on the end and, and turned on that machine. And back in those days, they weren't near as sophisticated as they are now. They didn't show a picture of everything in regard to the baby. You couldn't make out features and all of that. But she started rolling that around on Lenore's belly and until she found and we started to hear the Anybody remember that? And when I heard the heartbeat of my child, because it was a different experience for me, she was carrying the child. I mean, it was a, a, a very clear and real experience for her every moment. For me, I knew about it. But it became so real when I heard the heartbeat. You see, Ahaz wasn't a godly man. It's not surprising any of the things he did. That he made his own arrangements. That he took that which was precious and made it profane. That he never looked to God's presence. But we're a group of people, all of us in here today, you wouldn't have gotten up and come this morning if a part of you doesn't want to draw near to God. But what does it mean to be near to God? Well, we have to experience His presence. And yes, it has to be done through faith because He doesn't reveal Himself to our five senses. But when we begin to hear the heartbeat of God in our lives, what a change that can be. Because you see, I had to get close enough, close enough to be able to hear that heartbeat because it was so faint and it had to be amplified by that machine. And that's so true with God. God is everywhere all around us. But if you don't get close enough to Him, you'll never hear the heartbeat of God. And that's the way to overcome fear. Draw close. If you want to draw closer to God, reach out and pray. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing, and that's not just a commandment that we can't ever fulfill. That's God to talk with you and to hear from you. Draw near. Communicate to Him. We're open up the Word of God. When's the last time you studied from 2 Kings? Let me tell you, there are fascinating things all throughout the Bible when you're reading with an open mind and heart and saying, God, teach me. Try it sometime. Just open up your Bible and put your finger down and start reading. And I promise you, something there will apply to your life. We need to hear the heartbeat of God. And the only way we can is by drawing ever closer. And that is the great power of God's people over fear. He has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Therefore, I may boldly say, what can man do unto me? This morning, there may be someone here today that has not yet come to the Lord. And you've not met yet met Him. It's not halfway. He went 99% of the way. But you still must accept and want to be in a relationship with Him. And that's done through faith, which begins with your belief, but is culminated in that new birth where you die to yourself in the watery grave of baptism, are united with Him, become a part of the kingdom, the church, and all your sins are cleansed. If you've not done that, you'll never be able to hear His heartbeat. you never be close enough to Him until you draw near to Him. Die to yourself and live for Him. Or perhaps there's someone here today that you've done that. You have faith, but you're still keeping Him at a distance. And your fears are consuming you. Draw near to God. Look for, listen for the heartbeat of God. Come right now as we stand and as we sing. Oh.
In our Sunday morning class recently, a question was asked, what motivates you to be good or to do good things? Some of the answers that, that came back were fear, as we heard in our lesson today. Compassion was another answer. Obedience was an answer. And one of the four that, that I, I recognize as we all should know it's love. There's a verse in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that says, And now abide faith, hope, and love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. So I say, what is important to you? What's important in your life? John goes a little bit further in chapter 3, verse 16, when he gives us the perfect definition for the word love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Another special verse also found in the book of John, chapter 15. We read about the love Jesus has for us. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. 
God sent his son to the earth to become the ultimate sacrifice for us. Jesus then went to the cross and became the greatest example of love that we have. During the hours before the crucifixion, Jesus set aside some time to establish a memorial, a way to remember what he did and how great his sacrifice was. That special time is recorded three times in scripture. Three verses in Matthew chapter 26, three verses in Mark chapter 14, and again in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul remembers the same event again with three verses. Matthew 26 reads, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. In Paul's account, he explains the importance of how to with words like examine yourselves and partake worthily. One who was motivated by love is the only way to explain what Jesus did for us that dreadful night and day some 2,000 years ago. He is the most powerful being that ever walked the earth, but we must go to God's word to find out what motivated him to do what he did for us. That motivation was love. The Son of God, not only the most powerful, but also the greatest example. What, made, what motivates you today? Is it fear, compassion, obedience, or love? Let us examine ourselves and be worthy as we remember him this day. You will prepare your bread. pray. Our great God and Father in heaven, we come before you acknowledging your infinite love for us, for the blessings that we enjoy being a part of your family. We're thankful, Father, for your greatness and for your power. Help us to realize that we are weak and frail in your sight, and that as we come to you today, we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us as he hung on that cross. His broken body is represented by the bread that we're about to eat. May we eat that bread, Father, remembering that sacrifice and how important it is to us as we await for his return. In his name we pray. Amen. Now, please, if you'll prepare your cup. Let's pray. Father, we remember the words of Jesus as he said to drink from this cup. What's there represents the blood that he shed on the cross. As we drink this, Father, may we realize the importance of that blood and that it cleanses us as we Go from day to day in contact with you and walking in the light. Forgive us, Father, of our sins as we partake this, this cup and the importance of it. In his name again we pray. Amen. Another part of our worship today and on the first day of every week is to lay by in store as God has prospered us. These funds are set aside for various 
parts of our effort here to serve God. Our elders have determined our budget and according to the needs, and especially for those that are uh, missionaries working in, in hard, hard places. These funds are designed for an encouragement and enhancement of our work here. Our uh, contribution trays are not passed, they are left in the foyer. If you have placed your offering there, then that's wonderful. If you have yet to do that, they're still there and available, or they are electronic means by which you can contribute. Whatever you do, I pray that you'll remember what David said in 1 Chronicles 29, that everything we have belongs to God, and we can only give back to him what is already his. As we do that, help us to do it wisely. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are mindful of your greatness, your goodness, for the wonderful blessings that we enjoy, for the countless material things that we have. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to be better stewards of these blessings, that we may return to you a portion of that would be pleasing to you. We pray that the things that are done with them will be bring you honor and glory and increase the kingdom. We pray in your son's name. Amen. It has been a great morning to be together in worship, and it's good to see each and every one of you here this morning. By way of announcements, first we have a card of thanks that says to the Outreach Committee at West Main, thank you so much for the generous donation given to our grandchildren. The storm in Monroe County affected so many, two of our precious grands included. Your donation helped replace items that were lost or destroyed. We are so thankful for all the help given to that area by so many in our church family. You have certainly been an influence for good in the name of Jesus and his church. Thank you for all of the good work you do. It may often go unnoticed. This is in Christian love, Teddy and Becky May. On our prayer list, Chuck Bigno has been in the hospital, but he's home now. He has several tests coming up soon, so please continue to remember him. And Larry Chittum, Mar Marilyn Chittum's husband, passed away this morning. And Marilyn is Jim Wall's sister, so please remember that family. <clears throat> And our announcements, the Community Outreach Project for May is to assist the Faith Haven with some of their most needed items. This is a place that provides a safe temporary emergency home for neglected, abandoned, abused children. Um, they operate on grants and state funds, so that these donations are very important. They're asking for items like toiletries, um, deodorants, toothpaste, Vaseline, white towels, washcloths, dish towels, paper towels, and toilet paper. So if you bring these, please place them in the plastic tub in the hallway. The care box is needing volunteers to fill it weekly, the months of June through July. That yellow sign-up sheet is in the hallway table along with information there. Happy Heart Ladies will be meeting this Thursday at 10 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall to continue the outreach project. Happening today, a wedding shower for Jenna Cox will be held this afternoon at the Face from 1.30 to 3. She is registered at Elizabeth Clare's and Amazon. Our graduating college and high school seniors will be recognized next Sunday, May the 14th. And it's time to start thinking about volunteering for VBS. The theme this year is Come to Egypt and will be held July 9th through 12th. You know, last year was a great, great event. A lot of planning organization went into that. So please consider using your talents to further this mission for our young people. And everyone is invited to attend the 60th birthday celebration of Tolly White next Saturday, May the 13th. And Tolly, when we saw this, we could not believe that because you we thought maybe 35, but not 60. But the 60th celebration of Tolly White, um, Saturday, May the 13th, place that will take place in the Activity Center at 6 p.m. And parents, please note a change in classes this morning. Our two and three-year-old class will not meet this morning. I apologize for the inconvenience there. Now, Carrie's lesson this morning on have fear and being able to have God there to hold our hand through times of fear and stuff. I think this is a great closing song so we can, we can rejoice to know that God is always there for us. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let's stand while we sing.
Seated. The elders have asked the deacons to give an update and tell a little about, about the work they're involved in for the benefit of new members. We're doing this at the end of the Sunday morning services and it'll take a few months to cover as we have 15 deacons. Now I'll try to be quick for this, but uh, we're going to extend the class periods by five to 10 minutes uh, for that. For those new members, my name is Jim Wall. Russ Harrell and I both serve as worship deacons. Now, Russ is not here today, but the, for the new members, he, he leads singing. He led singing last week, and he teaches the young adult class. Um, we sign a, assign men to serve in the various areas of the worship service. And first of all, I want to thank all of you that do serve. Uh, we make these assignments for a whole month, and the list is prepared and available the last Sunday prior to the month being planned for. And this is posted on the fo uh, church Facebook page. Uh, copies are put on the table in the lobby, and it's also in our church directory app. Uh, next slide, please. And we assign those duties based on the member's record involvement forms that have been filled out in the past. And it's been quite a while since some of the, our members have filled out a form. Uh, we like to update these periodically. In October, these forms were passed out in our classes. And uh, of course, this is for both men and women to fill out. And only 29 men filled out the form at that time. Uh, these forms are kept on the bottom shelf on the table outside uh, the office. I put some forms on the table out in the lobby so you can pick them up. Um, the forms include other things that both men and women can do uh, other than worship service duties, uh, such as delivering to the needy, doing things for shut-ins, making visits, greeting visitors, assisting with youth activities, and teaching classes. As a, uh, now, there may be some that don't want to serve in the public speaking areas of the worship. Uh, there are other areas of the worship, such as uh, ushering, uh, the sound, and a PowerPoint, and greeting visitors. So there's other things that can be done. Um, we like those that haven't filled out a recent involvement form. Pick one up and fill one out, please. Now, if, if you don't want to participate in the worship service, that's fine. Just please fill out your contact information and uh, mark any other things that you want to do. Uh, and turn it into, uh, put it on the desk in the office or give it to one of the elders or me or Russ. Uh, now, we can assume if you don't have one of these files, uh, these forms on record that you're willing to serve as any capacity that's needed. <laughs> now, we could use some additional song leaders. Uh, so if you don't have one on file, you may see that you're a song leader one day. Now, if you find that you won't be able to serve your assignment, please try to find a replacement or swap with someone else for another week. Um, and please notify me or Russ so we can get uh, it to Candace, and so that the bulletin she emails out and the one she prints out will be correct. Now, we send out reminders on Saturday in case you've overlooked an assignment. Uh, for those serving in the worship, please, please try to arrive 10 minutes prior to the services so we can be sure everyone is here and that everybody can be seated for worship. Now, you may need to set your alarm clock for 10 minutes earlier. 
The other things we do is to make communion, make sure the communion is prepared. We have a sign-up list for those who are wishing to prepare communion on the table down the hallway. And by the way, the October and the December uh, slots have not been filled yet. Now, while on the topic of communion, be sure to discard your communion cups in the waste basket when you leave. If you leave them, somebody else, somebody's going to have to come around and pick those up. Um, uh, we get announcements to the person doing the con announcements and get the scripture readings to those doing the scripture reading and also to Jimmy for the PowerPoint. Next slide, please. Now, another thing that I've been involved in is the church directory. At the beginning of the year, I launched our church directory out. I'm the administrator, and Lenora is one of the editors. We, can, we keep that updated and make changes when needed. You're able to make your own changes for your own family in that directory. If you, any, well, you want to have the app on your phone or computer, just let me know. Uh, I know who has a login and who has not created a login. If you, you, know, you have to have an email in the directory in order to create a login. And if you try to create it and find out something, you can't create it, it may be that I have the email wrong in the directory, so get with me and we'll get that corrected. Uh, we have 140 emails that have logins, and we have 67 emails in the directory that have yet to create a login. Now, I know some of you may be using the login for your spouse, and that's fine. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of information in the app besides the family's contact information. And, uh, of course, in that information, you can click on the address, and it'll pull up your map software in, on your phone, and you can get directions. You can click on a phone number to email or text somebody or click on an email address to send an email. It's pretty neat. Uh, it has the staff members, the birthdays, the anniversaries, and I keep the prayer list, the community outreach, and Shepherd's Corner updated from the bulletin. And there's information for our Zoom class, the ladies' Bible class, the Thursday morning men's class, the men's class, the men's list, the communion preparation list, kit team sign-up uh, list, and BBS, and various other things that, are, that you can access in that app. I also make family pictures for the directory. And if you'd like to have your picture updated, just please let me know. I'd be glad to do it. And I always keep the pictures updated on the uh, TV down uh, the hallway as well. I hope this gives you a better understanding of some of the things we do. Thank you. Now, let's, let us be dismissed. And if I, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity we had to come here to worship you. We pray that our worship has been pleasing in your sight. We pray that our knowledge and our faith have been increased by being here today and we pray we take this lesson that we had today and try to find ways to apply it to everyday lives pray that you be with those in our sick list and pray that you provide for their needs and be with those that are lost loved ones and comfort them as only you can and please go with us to our classes and afterwards to our homes and bring us back together tonight in jesus name we pray amen Thank you.